Thank you all. Welcome to the afternoon and welcome for, to Haas. For those of you who are not Haas students, I want to really acknowledge just once again in the middle of the day the wonderful job that the Haas students have done in putting on this conference. And I just want to take one moment to say how grateful I am that Haas and Berkeley are schools in which we choose to honor someone for her public service and her commitment to justice. I think that makes us a very special business school. So with that, let me introduce Kamala Harris. In December, go ahead, yes, let's give her a hand. And I just want to tell you a little bit about not only who she is by her titles and her awards, but what she's actually accomplished in the world, too. So in December 2003, Kamala Harris was elected as the first woman district attorney in San Francisco's history, and the first African-American woman and a South Asian American woman in California to hold this office. She was overwhelmingly reelected to a second term in November 2007. Kamala was born and raised right here in Oakland. She's the daughter, and I love this, only a woman would have in her introduction her mother and her father. Thank you. <laughs> She's the daughter of Dr. Shamala Gobalan, a Tamilian breast cancer specialist who traveled to the United States from Chennai, India, to pursue her graduate studies at UC Berkeley. After attending public schools, her strong commitment to justice and public service led her to Howard University, America's oldest historically black university, and then again, University of California, Hastings College of Law. Kamala Harris has spent her entire professional life in the trenches as a courtroom prosecutor. After graduating from Hastings, she took a position again right here in Alameda County's District's Attorney's Office, where she specialized in prosecuting child sexual assault cases. As a deputy district attorney, she also prosecuted cases for homicide and robbery. She worked in that office from 1990 to 1998, before going on to serve across the bridge, the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. In 98, Harris managed, was named managing attorney for the career criminal unit of the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, where she prosecuted three strikes cases and seri serial felony offenders. She then headed the, the San Francisco City Attorney's Division on Families and Children. Now, as San Francisco DA, Harris, a prosecutor of nearly 20 years, has focused extensively on fighting violent crime. She's increased conviction rates for serious and violent offenders. She's expanded services to victims of crime and their families. She's created new prosecution divisions focused on child assault, on public integrity, and on environmental crimes. And she's lost, launched innovative re-entry initiatives to prevent re-offending. To combat one of San Francisco's biggest challenges, gun violence, she created a gun specialist team and implemented tough gun charging policies. This work is paying off. Listen to some of these results. The district attorney's office has more than doubled its trial conviction rate for gun felonies to 90%. Under her leadership, the office has sent 50% more serious and violent offenders to state prison, has put more than 220 gang members behind bars, and convicted more than 1,200 domestic violence offenders. As former director of a battered women's shelter, I thank you. <laughs> According to the San Francisco Superior Court, the office's overall felony conviction rate is at its highest point in nearly 15 years. Harris has brought much needed consistency and innovation to the handling of narcotics and quality of life crimes. Her office has tripled the number of misdemeanor cases taken to trial, and Harris has assigned senior prosecutors to specialize, to specialize in prosecuting graffiti, vandalism, and auto burglaries. She has also launched unprecedented programs of outreach to San Francisco neighborhoods and communities and brought free legal clinics to immigrant communities. She is a recipient of many awards. California's largest legal newspaper, the Daily Journal, designated Harris as one of the top 75 women litigators in California, the only elected official to receive that honor, as well as one of the top 100 lawyers in the state. 
She was recognized as a woman of power by the National Urban League and received the Thurgood Marshall Award from the National Black Prosecutors Association. She's been featured on The Oprah Show in Newsweek as one of America's 20 most powerful women. She was selected as one of 24 elected leaders throughout the country to, to serve on the Rodell Fellow for, uh, with the Aspen Institute. She's also been elected to the Board of Directors of the California District Attorneys Association, a Vice President of the National District Attorneys Association, and she served as co-chair of Barack Obama's presidential campaign. So would you join me in welcoming Kamala Harris? That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I think I'm mic'd up, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I, this is an overwhelming uh, crowd, and I, and I know who you are. I've been reading about you. You all are just tremendous, and that you're gathered here this Saturday to, to spend with each other time and fellowship and networking and, and just mutual support, I think, is fantastic. So congratulations to Haas and to all of you. Um, when I was thinking about coming to this group, I was thinking about an interview that I... I Gave many times when I was, after I was first elected. Some of you may have heard the story, but so I was elected as the first woman DA, and then these reporters would come up to me and, and they'd ask me this very original question, and they would all say, Well, so what, what does it feel like to be the first woman elected DA of San Francisco? <laughs> and I'd say, You know, how do you answer that? It's a, well, you know, I mean, I've always been a woman, so I, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm sure a man could do the job just as well. <laughs> And so I think that that kind of is, is part of what we're talking about today, um, which is that, you know, absolutely, we know our experience, our life experience. We know each of us what we bring to the table. And we also know that, that there are definitely challenges and barriers that still um, need to be and will be broken by you in this room. And, um, and let's find humor and celebration in it, but also recognize the significance of what each of you are doing. Um, so... Very honored to be here. And um, as I'm sure you all have already probably discussed, uh, you know, this morning, for, let's just set the stage in terms of what we are, um, what we are challenged with, with dealing with. Um, what we know is that the Fortune um, Top 50 Women in Business listed only three CEOs of publicly held companies about 10 years ago. And as of today, there are only about 15 women running Fortune 500 companies. So... To break into leadership, many of us have had to break barriers along the way, either because of our gender or because of our commitment to innovation, and in some cases, both. But I think the experience that we have of breaking into leadership, and in that way, perhaps being the first because of our gender or being the first because we bring an original thought, is something that helps to shape us as leaders and is unique in very important ways. Take my career, for example. When I decided to run for district attorney in San Francisco, it was considered a man's job. Even in San Francisco, there had not been a woman elected district attorney. And so I heard what I think many of you have heard. Um, I, and, it, and it was in the context of this. I decided to take on that office and challenge an incumbent DA. He came from an old political family, been in office two terms. His nickname was K.O., is K.O., um, because he was known as being a boxer who would knock people out. So there I was, um, the first in early days of that campaign, and I was sitting in a campaign office, and we got our first poll results. I was very eager, um, a little nervous, but, but excited. And then I read that piece of paper, and it told me that we were at a very healthy six points in the polls. <laughs> Which, of course, yes, is six in 100. And, um, <laughs> and, and my two male opponents were, were significantly ahead of me at that point. And one of them, of course, was the incumbent and my former boss. And so... Folks told me um, two things uh, that you probably have heard or may hear in your career. The first thing I was told is that I couldn't do it. I was told, why would you want to put yourself through that, Kamala? It's going to be a lot of hard work, as though we shy away from hard work. 
And I was told that I had no chance. The other thing I was told was that the goals that I had set as a candidate could not be accomplished. I was told, well, if this is such a big problem, why hasn't someone done something about it before? Or if this is such a great idea, why hasn't something happened before, right? The idea being, of course, that all great things that can be done have been done. <laughs> and so I didn't listen. I didn't listen, um, although I'll tell you at the beginning, especially sitting in that room looking at those poll numbers that first time, I felt really small. But there were a lot of people around me that were encouraging the idea that even though it had not been done before, we can imagine how things can be and we should be motivated by that sense of vision to keep pushing through even when we feel small and people tell us no one like you has done this before or that thing can't be done. And so I stood for office anyway and then guess what? Well, you know the story. We won. <laughs> and what I was thinking about in those early days and have continued to think about in my career as a prosecutor is that, you know, I, I did not run because I wanted to be the first woman. I ran because I believed I could do the job better. And in that way, I believed that my field, criminal justice, was facing a crisis point and needed innovation. I believed that the district attorney's office needed a turnaround. And so I didn't listen, and I won, and then the job started. And as you've heard, um, it's, it's difficult when you first start out in these positions when you're trying to turn around something. There are a lot of challenges and a lot of goals that you set and that must be met. And so when I took over at the DA's office in 2004, I'll tell you, morale in my office was very low. It had and had experienced some of the lowest conviction rates um, of any DA's office in the state. And my first day on the job, I'll tell you, I walked through the halls, and in 2004 in San Francisco, I found that two-thirds of my lawyers didn't have email. I even spotted Wang computers, <laughs> which of course should only have a place in a computer museum. There were attorneys in my office that literally, if you didn't buy your own phone as an attorney, you could rely on the office standard, which was a rotary phone. 2004. There was no electronic database of cases. So it meant that if you wanted to do a search, we weren't talking Google. We were talking having your fingers do a search through the file cabinet for that paper folder that represents, by the way, a crime, a set of victims, a set of witnesses, legal issues that must be resolved, and work that must be done. And this is how you could find that important case. So, you can imagine from what I have described, the scene that I envisioned when I first walked in there. And this scene, among other things, not only is surprising and a bit shocking, I will tell you that simply put, this scene produced bad results. So, what we had to do was address what would otherwise be considered mundane issues, which deals with building an infrastructure and committing ourselves to professionalism so that we could produce the results that anyone should expect of any of us as professionals. And it meant, in my particular case, dealing with the fact that we had slipped to a 51% conviction rate for serious and violent crimes in San Francisco, and that must have been dealt with. Because, as you all know, as leaders in business, as students of business, we must all think about the work that we do in a sense of thinking about, as it is for me in public service, whether we're delivering a return on our taxpayers' investment, in particular, in the case of safety and justice. So, we set a few big goals, and we pursued them with pretty much relentless focus, and that meant vowing to raise the, convi uh, conviction, the conviction rates for felonies. It meant vowing to build a professional office. 
It meant dedicating ourselves and rededicating ourselves to prosecuting the most serious and violent crimes, which of course include homicides and other crimes of violence, sex crimes against children, domestic violence, and public corruption. It meant doing the first thing that I did when I got there, which is performing an audit of the office. Not just a financial audit, but a performance audit. Because something I've come to learn, and I'm sure you all know, is that often when we are faced with an issue or a problem or a system that must be fixed, there will be a lot of loud, squeaky wheels that will automatically demand our attention. But invariably, what we will find is that if you go down that dark hall at the end, that room where no one goes, it's some corner room and some guy's in there, nobody really knows his name and he's working under this green visor, <laughs> and you find that's the guy that's making the whole train run, right? So you got to perform an audit. Figure out where everything is and how is it being used and how is it relevant to the overall system and the operation of the whole. And so I performed an audit of the office. And the first priority was, of course, to determine through that process how we would more appropriately distribute the limited resources we had to achieve this goal of public safety and a professional law office. And so what I did is not only realizing that, but realizing that through that process that we needed to shift resources. What we learned through the process is that resources had to be shifted in a way that I gave more attention to the idea of building up support staff so that the lawyers would, instead of spending 30% of their time at a Xerox machine, be more focused in being in the library to do the legal research that is necessary and be in the courtroom where their skills would be most apparent in terms of the need to stand before a jury and talk about the demands of justice. It was the work also of realizing something that took me a little while, but I ultimately embraced. And I embraced this concept pretty much one day when I realized, when I looked in the mirror, that my forehead was black and blue. Because you see, I had been banging it against a wall <laughs> forever. <laughs> because I had figured out everything that was wrong, and I had a plan, for how it would all, a plan for how it would all be fixed. But I realized I simply could not do it alone, and that there comes a point when we all must recognize that if the goal is to actually get something done, then we need to make choices and prioritize and simply embrace this concept of triage. And what does triage tell us? Well, do you all remember the uh, television show MASH? So how did that go? So basically, Hawkeye's standing there, and the helicopter's coming in with all those wounded soldiers. And there's the surgical tent. And you've got only so many surgeons and only so many pints of blood. And each of those souls coming in is important. But you've got to make some decisions about who's going in the tent. And it's not to the exclusion of recognizing what may stay outside. But you've got to get something done. So I embraced, reluctantly, the concept of triage. Let's start somewhere, focus on particular goals, and get them done. And in fact, I used to tell my staff, listen, no more new boxes. No more new boxes. You know how I, this is how I keep a list of things I need to do. I have a yellow pad, and I have the thing that needs to get done, and I draw a box next to it, right? No more new boxes. Let's keep three boxes at any one time, check those off, and then move on to the next boxes. And, and there's a simple reason for that. One, your sanity. <laughs> the reality of it is this. When you work as hard as we all work, you owe it to yourself to see that you are accomplishing your goals. You owe it to yourself. You work so darn hard. And if every morning you woke up, you know, there's one time that your body will not lie to you, no matter how much adrenaline and drive you have. That's when you first wake up. <laughs> and your body's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and then your brain says, you can do it, you can do it. And then you get out of bed and you keep going, right? But to really make sure that you can get out of bed every morning, you need to know that you have actually accomplished something. So for your sanity, 
you have to have a limited number of boxes, triage, focus on those goals, and then get them done. There's another reason. It's that point of leadership. The people around you who rely on your leadership, on your vision, need to see that you're actually getting things done. In that way, you will empower yourself to be a leader. And no one will fault you for creating goals, some of which may seem small and some large. And as long as you say what needs to get done and you get it done, in that way, you can continue to encourage people to believe that as much as you are banging them over the head to work hard, yes, we can get this done, if they see it being done, they feel a sense of accomplishment. So for all those reasons, triage was important. And so, as a result of all of this early focus with my office, I'd like to report to you, as you've already heard, what you in business call our quarterly earnings. Um, for me, that quarter is about six years. Um, but what we were able to do is, yes, we were able to reach the highest conviction rates that San Francisco has seen in, in 15 years. We nearly doubled the number of serious and violent offenders that were sent to state prison. Yes, I created a gun policy. Some people ask me why, because there would never been a gun policy. Why do we need a gun policy? I said, well, guns kill. <laughs> so. <laughs> So these are the things we did. We created a child assault unit. There had not been one, but one of the things I know as a career prosecutor who at one time specialized in those cases, those crimes exact such a, a, a toll and significant lifelong injury on its victims if we don't take them seriously and realize that we have to have a specialized focus. And, and as an aside, I'll tell you just on the issue of children, and we as women have been charged with taking on that responsibility, one, because we freely and naturally own it, but the other reality of it is that we all know, unfortunately, issues that impact children for too long have been marginalized, and child advocacy has for so long been marginalized to be the thing that women care about, or parents care about, or people who care about cute, cuddly things care about. There's small issues, maybe because they're small people, when in fact, if we focus our resources on those issues that impact children, I promise you we are in fact focusing on one of the biggest issues that we can face in terms of a return on our investment. So that was the work. Thank you. Thank you. And so this was the work that we did. And, um, and we created a public integrity unit. And we created an environmental justice unit. And we focused on elder abuse. I focused on mortgage fraud. Why? Because it's a crime that is absolutely impacting so many people, and in large part going without consequence. Because one of the things we in law, and especially in law enforcement, really don't like are those paper cases. Right, you know, for any of you who has bought a house, you probably, how many of us really read every page that we signed when we got that loan? And so there are people being ripped off completely um, in that context over the last couple of years. And, and we needed to have a real focus around saying, let's create a structure and a skill set within this law enforcement office to deal with the paper case because that is a crime that is going without consequence and is injuring its victims to a great degree. So all that to say that when we talk about leadership, the first point of that is just doing our job, right? First, you just have to get the job done. Everything I've talked about so far was getting the job done of being the district attorney of a major city in this country making sure it was a professional law office, making sure that there was accountability for serious and violent crime, making sure that we were appropriately distributing your tax dollars in this public law office. But I would suggest to you that leadership is different than just getting the job done. Getting your job done is what you're expected to do. Leadership, I would suggest, is about assuming responsibility to take on larger problems. And so, in my case, that meant taking on the problems that I believed were plaguing um, us and our failing criminal justice system. And these problems are highlighted by the following facts. 
Since 1980, California's population grew about 50%, but our prison population grew at a staggering 617%. The average prison sentence in California is 24 months. I'll get back to that fact later. 120,000 people are released from California prisons every year because they have served their time, but within three years of their release, 70% of them reoffend. That's called recidivism. California prisoners are released with $200 and a bus ticket, and they're sent back home. Meanwhile, they have no skills, no education, no work, and little to lose, and the only thing that has changed since they went to prison is that they've been in prison. And for all of this, we, as Californians, pay over $10 billion a year. So, if you think of California as a large and diversified corporation, incarceration would be our single largest line item of business. And it produces a return on investment that we cannot afford. When you look at it, those offenders, first of all, let me be clear, deserve to go to prison. What I'm discussing is not about saying there should be anything other than accountability and consequence once someone commits a crime. That's not the point. Once that accountability has occurred, once there has been consequence, once there has been appropriate punishment, what we need to recognize as a state is that the return on our investment, our ROI calculation, as you folks talk about, um, as a state, tells us that we have not been smart in re-entering ex-offenders back into our communities in a way that they don't re-offend. What's more, because our justice investment is so in the red, we have less money to pay for those tools that really could make our communities safer on a daily basis, such as more police and better crime-fighting technology. Also, because of that waste, we have less money for long-term investments that we know, without a doubt, prevent crime and create th thriving communities in general, education, health care, and job training. So I would suggest to you that in many ways, on this issue, we are at a crisis point. We need a new dialogue about crime and safety. We need to move beyond the old conversation that suggests that either you're tough on crime or you're soft on crime as though there are only two choices. And instead, we need to get to the point where we're talking about and asking, are we smart on crime? And being smart on crime, I believe, is like being smart in business. It means that we must bring innovation to these systems in a way that we force ourselves to be constantly focused on results. Leaders across the nation, from Newark to Boston to Atlanta and Texas, red states and blue states and purple people, are coming to understand that we have to focus on breaking the pattern of crime, prison, release, crime, prison, release. And for some criminals, yes, that will mean longer prison sentences. But for many others, we can stop this costly and dangerous cycle. And it makes sense that we do. Because the vast majority of offenders in our system are nonviolent offenders who within two years will be released from prison having served their time. Remember the statistic I shared with you earlier. The average sentence in California is 24 months. Let me tell you what that tells you. There are two facts you can infer from that. One, the average prisoner has been sentenced for a nonviolent offense. If it's a violent offense, he's going in for 15 to life. The second fact, they're all coming out. And we don't have meaningful criminal justice policy for dealing with that. Because frankly, we've been ostriches. We've been sitting there thinking, OK, crime is committed. Catch a thief, arrest him, prosecute him, send him to jail. Good, done with that guy. He's coming out in 24 months with no changed circumstances since he went in. This is not smart planning if we are absolutely and truly invested, I believe, in achieving public safety. And for those reasons, I would suggest to you that we cannot afford to continue what we have been doing as a state or as a country 
and that we in law enforcement and government, frankly, need to better adopt the principles that you in business understand, which is let's infuse metrics into our analysis and measurement of success. And instead of relying on the fact that we judge systems based on an adherence to tradition, we will judge ourselves based on whether we are producing our intended goal, which of course for law enforcement is public safety. So for that reason, in San Francisco, we pioneered what is essentially a public-private partnership to reduce recidivism, this reoffense rate, and we call it Back on Track. It's an initiative that we created five years ago and basically focused on first-time, young, non-violent, non-gang-affiliated non drug sales offenders. And Back on Track was born out of a belief that the approach must be to require accountability. That individual must be held accountable for the crime they committed, which is low-level sales of drugs, so we require them to plead guilty. And they must be held accountable to their family and their community and must hold themselves accountable to their families and their communities. And so essentially what we did with this public-private partnership back on track is we created incentives using the carrot and stick that I have as someone who carries a big badge, which is essentially, I'm going to tell you everything your mom or your grandmom told you, but I'm also going to tell you, you better do it because otherwise I'm going to send you to jail. It's amazing how you get attention that way. <laughs> And so what we did is we basically focused on this population and did it by rejecting outdated measurements of success. What we did is we said, let's measure ourselves based on bottom line results. And essentially in this initiative, what we did is this. It's a public-private partnership. What does that mean? Well, as the DA of San Francisco, I called the president of the Chamber of Commerce and called some of our leaders in business. And I'm going to tell you something I have experienced in my almost seven years as DA. Leaders in business, you all consider yourselves to be leaders of business. But when you get a call from someone like me, you also see yourselves as being leaders of the community. And it's a wonderful thing. Because I can call people who have never in their lives been a part of public service, as it is traditionally thought of who will literally take the call and say, yes, I would love to help. I want to hear a new idea. What can I do? Because leaders in business understand that in order for any business to thrive in terms of your underlying goal, you must have a safe and healthy community. You know that your clients, whoever they may be, need to live in a society where they feel comfortable, where they feel free, where they are free of fear. You all know that in order for any business community to thrive, the larger community must be healthy and must feel that it is in a process of having an opportunity to thrive. So what we did with Back on Track is I called up the leaders in the business. I called up some of the leaders in our labor um, uh, community, in particular the carpenters and the plumbers, the building trades folks, and called up some of our nonprofits. And we looked at this offender population and address the fact that in these 18 through 24-year-olds, okay, why did I do 18 through 24-year-olds, by the way? Well, when I was at Howard University in college, we were 18 through 24, and we were called college kids. But when you're in the system and you turn 18, you're considered an adult, period, without any regard to the fact that that's the very phase of life in which we have invested billions of dollars in this world in these wonderful places called colleges and universities, knowing that that's actually the prime phase of life during which we can mold and shape and direct a human being to become a productive adult. So what we did is basically I brought a bunch of people around the table and said, let's do something about this. And so my business community said, OK, let's figure out a way to get them some jobs. And the labor folks said, well, we've got apprenticeship programs, the carpenters and the plumbers, let's enroll them because we know almost none of them have employable skills. Let's, our educational folks, enroll them in a GED completion program and then get them over to City College. Let's address the fact, community-based folks, that a lot of them are parents 
who have a natural desire to parent their children, but not necessarily the skills. So let's bring on board the community folks who can support their parenting needs and also introduce them to those other folks called the PTA. And as a result of this focus, this public-private partnership, this initiative back on track, has over the last five years reduced the recidivism or reoffense rate for this population from 54% to less than 10%. It's the <clears throat> And I'm proud, thank you, and, I've been, and I'm proud to tell you that it's actually been designated by the National DA's Association as a model for DA's offices around the country, and the United States Department of Justice has posted it as a model of innovation for law enforcement in the United States. And last year, Governor Schwarzenegger actually um, signed into law a bill I wrote and that was carried by Speaker, then Speaker Karen Bass that puts back on track in California's penal code as a model for the state of California of what we should be doing and can do better. And so, well, that, that, no, whatever. Oh, well, let's, keep, let's keep going, we've got so much else to talk about. Um, but, and, and I'm particularly happy to tell you that, that not only is it, I think, and we all agree probably, a success story in terms of the idea that we're gonna try something new and, we're, and it's actually, it can actually work. But the other aspect of it that is equally relevant, especially to you leaders in business, is what we can do through innovation to also be more efficient with our resources, right? Because after all, part of the definition in my mind of meaningful innovation is that we are efficient. So I will share with you this, that this initiative costs less than $5,000 per participant. To not do it means that for that next felony, it costs me $10,000 to prosecute every felony I prosecute, the simple felonies. Cost us $35,000 a year to house someone in the county jail. Cost us $51,000 a year to house someone in the state prison. This initiative, less than $5,000 per participant, and it's about workforce development, and it's about recognizing cycles, and it's about saying that we actually can, as a collective community, engage in meaningful public-private partnerships that actually work. And I'm also particularly happy to share with you all um, the impact it's had in particular on our female participants. 64% of the participants in this initiative have been women, and nearly three quarters of them have young children. And in addition to all of the other responsibilities they have to address, these women, of, of these women, 80% of them have a history of domestic violence, and at least half of them have spent some time in foster care. So what we are talking about is individuals who have taken initiative when given the support system. And what they have done is through their success, they are contributing to, for us, increased public safety, but also ending non-productive and unproductive cycles. And when I look at it in terms of what are the essential elements that have made it work, I'm very clear that this initiative could not occur without active and strong involvement from our private sector. We cannot make initiatives like this successful without, in the case of Back on Track, the partners that ranged from Nordstrom to 24-hour fitness. We had um, the Chamber of Commerce. We had the San Francisco 49ers and others. It was a collection of people who came together because they were willing to work outside of the silos of their particular business to collaborate. And, and I'll tell you frankly, one of the, the benefits that I've always enjoyed about holding public offices is not only the power to actually get the job done, we talked about that earlier, it's not only the power to attempt innovation, but it is also the ability, which you all have as well, to understand how we have a power to convene the ability to pick up the phone because you know people that respect you and bring them around a table to talk about something they may have never discussed collectively. And it's an amazing thing how after just that meeting, that may be an hour, an hour and a half, you have solved problems, much less solving the problems that you create through a plan because of the collaboration. So one of the things that I, um, of many things, I admire about you all and what you learn 
here at Haas and in your workplaces, is that you as business people, unlike I think generally those of us in law and government and, and, and in academia sometimes who, who kind of thrive on sitting around to talk about problems, um, you in business, what you know, and I think it's part of the culture of your work, you get together and when you do, you talk about how to fix something. And you talk about how to get it done. And that's a wonderful skill. And it's a wonderful gift that you as leaders in business can give not only to your workplace and your colleagues, but also as you walk out of here today to those other places where you work or live or volunteer because it's a very special skill. And I think that for the challenges that we face in whatever industry or business we've cho chosen, um, that the kind of determination that each of us has shown to break into leadership, the kind of determination that is what will help our organizations and our communities succeed, is the kind of determination to choose innovation over stagnation. It is the determination to setting big and maybe difficult goals and then pursuing them with a focus on the results. And it means knowing that you can do it. It means knowing that the new idea that you're seeking to achieve can be done. And it means knowing that even though it's never been done before, it doesn't mean it can't be done. It means having the creativity and the independence to say yes, where others have said no. It means where others have seen risk, that we should see opportunity. And it means where others have felt fear, that we should feel courage. And it means ignoring the naysayers because we can't afford to spend our time with the doubters and the disbelievers. And it means in this era, at this time, when we face so many challenges, knowing that you should trust in your talent and your ability. It means knowing that we need your leadership. And it means knowing that as it has been for me, there will be many times when you will be in a room and will be the only one that looks like you. And it means knowing when you are in that place, and it can be a physical room or a state of mind, where you think it's just you, that you should hold this image and this vision of what I see and know that there are gonna always be all of us there with you, by you, next to you, supporting you and pushing you forward and encouraging you and standing and clapping at you when you do those things that you know you can do even though it has never been done before. So in that way, I celebrate you all and I'm so happy to have been here today and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Questions? Thank you. I think we have a mic up here if anyone wants to ask a question. Hi, Kama. Um, how has uh, the decisions that you've made as a DA over the past six years um, either negatively or positively impacted the minority community? Um, there are a number of ways I can answer. That's a great question. Um, I think that um, one is there is that piece about role modeling. Uh, you know, and we know it, I think that's part of the spirit behind this program which is bringing everyone together so you can actually um, see how it has been done by those who are like you, so you can forge a path and, and if by nothing else, just mimicking what someone else has done. That's often a great way to figure it out. Um, and in that way, I think that, that there has, has been some impact because of, of, of 
you know, me holding this office that has allowed people to think about themselves differently. And in particular, you know, frankly, you know, I grew up here in Berkeley, as was shared with you. My parents were graduate students at, here at the University of California, Berkeley, in the 60s. And they met when they were actively involved in the civil rights movement. Um, so for me, that meant growing up around a bunch of adults who pretty much spent full time marching and shouting <laughs> um, about this thing called justice. But, you know, frankly, for me and my family and extended family and community, at that time, law enforcement was not considered to necessarily be a friend. And when I made the choice to become a prosecutor then, um, it was a very conscious choice. And in many ways, you know, I, and I had to defend that decision with some folks, like, you know, we have defended a thesis. But um, my point was that we, we can't, when we're talking about systems that we want to have an impact on, let, why do we always have to come at it from outside, you know, on bended knee or trying to break down the door? Shouldn't we also be at the table on the inside where we can have a voice and have an impact from that place as well? And so that's what I decided to do. Well, you know, when I was elected, I was elected as the first woman of color to be a DA in the state of California. Um, and, you know, there are still... Um, when you look at who is impacted by crime and who is act, impacted both because they are victims as well as offenders, there is a disproportionately large number of racial and ethnic minorities. And that relates to African Americans and Latinos. It also relates to immigrants. And to become a prosecutor is still not necessarily considered to be the way that you go if you want to do this work. The bias is generally more to go and be a defense attorney because that's the way you can help the community. There's certainly a role for that, but there is also a role to help the community as a prosecutor. And I hope that my, um, and, I, and I do believe, just look, looking at who you know, is telling me I'm thinking about becoming a prosecutor and hadn't thought about that before, that that has been an impact on, on minority ethnic communities. Um, you know, but again, my, as I said in my earlier remarks, the motivation that I have to do the work I do is that I, I sincerely believe there are smarter ways to achieve public safety. And that's it. People haven't gone before, and I know it's lonely when you step out in some directions that people haven't gone before. Have you had mentors who've helped helped you in this lonely journey? Yeah, I have. I mean, the first was my mother, and, um, and I've got great friends. And, and I have to tell you that when we take on these positions of leadership, um, and as a woman, there's a balance to be struck between being tough and being a bitch. <laughs> that you want to always do is surround and keep close your friends um, and your family. Who, you know, what, it, where, whatever form that takes. I have a sister I love and adore, you know, friends. But keep close the people who you can... Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you like this. So I, I mentor and, and train women when they're running for office. I'm an advisor to a couple of groups. And what I say to them is that when you're thinking about running for office, and this is true when you're thinking about succeeding in business, create a, a think, and consciously think about creating for yourself a safety group. And it would be that group of three or four people. And it doesn't have to be women only, by the way. But the people you could call at midnight, who you could cry with, who you could laugh at the thing you shouldn't be laughing with. You could curse, you could do whatever. And you can share it with them without fear of judgment. And make sure in that group you also have people who have some sense of what you're going through. Um, you know, and you have different friends, but there are some who just will always love and hug you, but not necessarily know what you're going through. But make sure you identify and start cultivating that group of people who you have. And in that way, they will keep you strong, or at least on your feet, at times when you're feeling wobbly. Um, because I'll tell you, I mean, back to one of the, 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 the points that I was trying to make in my speech, that, you know, the commitment to innovation. 
So here's the deal with that. It's really difficult. And it's in particular difficult when you hold public office. And I'm going to tell you why. This is how I figured it out, at least. You know, when, a, when a, an elected is up for re-election, nobody will ever take a political hit at that person for doing the job the way it's always been done. Good for you, Bob. You're doing it the way it's always been done. <laughs> right? Innovation, by definition, means you're bringing a new idea, a new method, or you know, a new device to a situation, which plays out like this. It will be well-planned. It will be well-thought-out. It will be well-intentioned. But whenever you're rolling out something new, there will, at some point, become apparent that there is a mistake or a glitch in the design. And when you're in these kinds of positions, that mistake or glitch is on the front page of the paper. And so, you have to take a knock for that. When I rolled out back on track, I took a big political hit when a couple of years later it turned out, especially in criminal law, because when you're taking, when you're doing innovation in the criminal justice system, let me tell you what that means. That means I'm doing something differently with somebody who's on my radar. Why are they on my radar? Because they committed a crime. Now remember, I'm focused on the nonviolent offender with these, these innovative programs, right? The fear will always be that guy will go out and kill a baby and a grandmother tomorrow. And then everyone will look backwards and say, why didn't you do with the, it the way it's always been done? Why did you try something new? It's a big risk. And so when I rolled out back on track, a couple years in, we learned that there was, basically there was a participant who went out during the time he was in the program, committed a robbery, there was a horrible injury to the victim, and turned out that this individual was an undocumented immigrant. And every, there was an article, that was written and said, Kamala Harris has created a program to shield illegal aliens. <laughs> right? Um, and that's when my friends came really in handy <laughs> to just say, it's so, you know, because I was upset about the unfairness and the mischaracterization and, 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 and don't people want these things fixed? Don't they understand what innovation requires? And, and that's when you have to rely on your friends who understand what you do and care about you and will support you without judgment, but also give you critical feedback when you need it. 